September of 2012, we left our home port of Seattle on a trip around the world in our Nordhaven 52 Dorona. Hello, this is Jennifer and James Hamilton aboard Nordhaven 52 Dorona in Stornoway, Scotland. Today we're going to replace the cylinder head on our Northern Lights 12 kilowatt generator. This is by far the biggest project we've ever taken on, and so before deciding to replace the cylinder head, we did extensive diagnostics that we described in our previous video. In this video, we'll actually replace the cylinder head and get that engine back into service again. Good morning. Alrighty. Here's the first piece of good news. Last night, this arrived. And this is a cylinder head, a brand new cylinder head for a Northern Lights 12 kilowatt generator. This is an M843 NW 3.3 cylinder head. It's so small. It's a small little engine. This baby is um, just a wonderful engine. It's, it's only about 20 horsepower. Which is, which is remarkably small, but it is 1.5 liters, so it's not that small, but uh, pretty small. Started its life, or started its design life, as, as a tractor engine, and Northern Lights has made a very successful en uh, generator series based upon this engine. Even our wing engine is, in fact, the, the same power plant. So I'm going to put this down here so it's out of our way. What else do you have down there? Uh, here we've got some feeler gauges for adjusting the valves later today. And here are brand new injectors. Since we're doing a top end overhaul, we'll put with 6,700 hours, we'll put new injectors into it as well. Well, the injectors are so tiny compared to the Deere. <laughs> yeah, the John, the John Deere 6068 AFM 75 to my left has gigantic uh, electronic injectors. It's a common rail engine and they're both quite big and also as is often the case, quite expensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If you can't be small, be expensive. <laughs> what we've got up here is oh, a lot of gaskets. cylinder head gasket. Um, all of the washers and, and gaskets and O-rings and everything else that we think we're going to need for this job. In addition, I've thrown down here a couple, uh, a couple the workshop manual and also the uh, the operator's manual and in the case of northern lights their operator's manual is remarkably detailed and so there's a bunch of things in there like valve clearance is 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 part of the um, operator's manual so adjusting valve clearance the electrical diagram for this job the only one that we're really going to want to have is all the torque specifications and specifically or most importantly the cylinder head torque specification is listed on this page and the order in which the cylinder head bolts are torqued down. What's the difference between an operator's manual and a workshop manual? Operator's manual for the, is, is for the person using the engine and the workshop manual is for the person servicing it. In the case of Northern Lights um, they put a lot of technical detail into their operator's manual. Usually an operator's manual, the first thing you want to do with one of those is throw it away. <laughs> and go find the workshop manual. <laughs> yeah, because there's absolutely nothing useful in it. In the case of Northern Lights, their, their operator's manual is actually quite good. And, and, and as you can see, I actually have one. Yeah. And the way we work, by the way, in, our, in this boat is uh, we don't have these manuals in paper form. Um, they're all in electronic form. If I'm doing a larger job and I think I'm going to want some of them, then I'll go ahead and print them out. And so that's that's what they're doing sitting there. Here's the here's the generator itself. This is 6,700 hours on it. In our previous video, we covered um, the diagnosis behind this job and and you know, why we think that the the valve seat in number three in number three exhaust num number three cylinder exhaust valve seat is is failing. However, never guaranteed when an external diagnosis that you're one hundred percent correct. We've been careful. We've been thoughtful about it. I'm reasonably confident, but still. Today will probably teach us a few things. We'll see a few things that we may not have expected. 
One thing I've mentioned in the last couple of videos is we have a rear main oil seal, seal leak here. And so normally everything's nice and clean and you see there's little bits of oil all over the place. And the reason for that is the rear main oil seal is leaking oil into the generator and, and that's spreading oil throughout the engine. My choice has been to wait for parts on the rear main oil seal. And the reason, well, of course, that's not a choice. That's a, you're stuck with that. The reason why I chose to, to do the, the cylinder head first is there's no point in changing a rear main oil seal if we have a persistent problem um, in, in some other part of the engine. So I'd like to see the engine running properly before we change that seal. It's a beast of a job. This whole back section of, of, the, of the generator has to come off. And you have to take apart the enclosure too, don't you? Yeah, the enclosure has to come off. Everything has to has to go that way. So it's it's a big job, and it, this is extremely heavy. You know, it's probably upwards of a oh, hundreds of pounds. The thing we're replacing today is actually between those two jobs, we'll have this engine completely apart. So for those interested from a video perspective, you're going to see this engine um, today from here above is going to be is going to be um, taken apart entirely. All of this is coming off and the cylinder head will be replaced. That's that unit right there. And then in the future, the whole back of, the, of this assembly is coming off and the seal would be replaced. The reason you see this ugly rag here is all, this is, this is over the oil filler. All modern engines run slight positive pressure on, in, the, in the crankcase and they're recirculating the crankcase vapors back down the intake. It's, it's a good thing to do from an emissions perspective, but because they're running slight positive pressure inside the crankcase, if you have a serious oil leak, as we do have right now on this engine, it makes it worse. So this neutralizes the pressure in the crankcase to zero. It means it's, it's outside pressure, and that just allows, the, allows us to minimize the, the amount of oil that's being leaked. And it's actually quite effective. It makes a, it makes a very big difference. All right, enough... enough uh, Enough pre preparation, let's get started. The first thing that needs to be done is we got to get the coolant out of there. So what do you do to get that out of there? There's a convenient drain on the side of the, of the block and then I'll take the cap off as well so it can run a little faster. How much coolant does it hold? You know, I'm not sure, but I think, I think it's just short of a couple gallons. I see, so it'll fit in that bucket? Yeah, it'll, it'll fit in this bucket takes a little longer than I like to to get it all out because it's a relatively small uh, drain but it's not too it's not too inconvenient and in the meantime I can start to plan some of the work that needs to be done like we'll be taking off these high pressure lines that that go from the injection pump to each injector that's that's injector three injector two and injector one so these high pressure lines have to come off then the return lines, this is the one down here, this return line has to come off. That's the return fuel? That's the returning fuel. So a lot of, in fact, most of the fuel that gets, that, gets, that gets driven to the injectors ends up returning and only a small amount gets injected into the engine itself. Is that normal for like gas engines too or is that specific to diesels? Um, gas engines are completely different. A diesel engine is referred to as, as CI engine or, or a compression ignition engine where, uh, and, and so the way it works on a diesel is they, they compress air until it's very hot and very dense and then inject diesel in a fine spray and that lights off the charge and, and, and causes the power to be generated. In a gas engine, an air-fuel mixture, not just air, air and fuel are put into the cylinder, it's compressed and a spark plug ignites the charge and that's referred to as an SI engine or a spark, a spark ignition engine. Now, when I said they're not at all the same, in fact, like all things in engineering, things tend to evolve together and so modern spark ignition engines are going to direct injection, which is what this diesel does, and the the difference between a gas engine and, and a diesel engine or a spark ignited engine versus a, a compression ignited engine are getting to be less and less and less all the time. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, and is, is the fuel actually used to cool the engine slightly? or it, it doesn't cool the engine at all, but the fuel system components are both lubricated and cooled by the diesel, and so that's why having a, a fair amount of, retur of return flow is a good thing because it's carrying some heat off some of these sensitive components like the injectors. 
still waiting for the antifreeze to drain. Okay. It's slowing down a bit. Yeah, it's getting getting close. It's an easy way to start my morning here, Saturday morning in Stornoway, is relax. Have, <laughs> relax with your antifreeze. <laughs> have, a have a glass of water and watch, watch the antifreeze drain and then look at the rest of the job and figure out what I'm going to need. Okay, there's that antifreeze done. Careful with that. Yeah, I already spilled, not spilled, but splashed a little small amount right there. There we go. So you're just going to put that back in later when we're done the job? Yeah, it's it's one year old antifreeze or a little bit less than one year old. So yeah, it's plenty fine. Could you pass me those that roll of wrenches as well? Okay, yeah. Thanks go. a lot. So what's first thing to do? Well, you got a lot of I've got a lot of flexibility in what I'm going to do. I think I'll probably take the high pressure lines off as the first thing. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to go up and get some tape as well because I'm going to want to tape off these any openings into the injection pump or into the fuel system in general, I want to have taped off. Oh, so nothing can contaminate it? Right. It's yeah. super important that this be absolutely uh, uh, surgically clean. You know, fuel system is very, very uh, sensitive. Fuel lines. Those are the high pressure fuel lines. And these are the pieces that hold them firmly together. Okay. And what I normally do is I'll find a place to, to put the screws and things a little bucket or a little container for it? Um, that could work, although I, I oftentimes just like to pile them on a rag so to keep things organized. Okay. So I'm going to put these tools here and use this for parts. So we got a couple bolts and a couple nuts and we're getting underway. Definitely. Wonder how big that pile is going to be before we're done. <laughs> it won't be that big. That was on there pretty tight. Snug, not too tight. Whenever I'm working around fuel systems, I always like to kind of shake the paint off a little bit because there's invariably small flakes of paint uh, as you crack things free. So to avoid it getting into the lines. Yeah, exactly. You can see little bits of fuel on us. Oh, a little fluid there? Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit dripping out. Yeah. So what I can't, you know, I haven't got an easy way to get access to there is I kind of want to, I'd like to hold that so that there's no chance. So, so you like to hold it so there's no chance of? Of, uh, if, if it, it'll be other half rotating. I see. And what would be the problem with that? Don't want, don't want to loosen it off or, or damage it. I just want to lift these high pressure lines off. So that is that a return line or a flow line? That's a high pressure line. Okay. Oh. 
I can smell just a little bit of diesel. Yep, it's nice that we can't smell diesel. Yeah, normally we can't smell any diesel in the engine room, which is, is good. Exactly the way you want it. Tuck those away somewhere else. Yeah, I'm going to tape off the ends of them as well, just to be on the safe side. Yeah, that is shifting. How's it going? Yeah, not, I'm not finding anything that fits in there. Oh, it's really tight. Yeah, that's what you mean. I'm not... I, it's probably fine to remove those, but I don't know that it's fine. So I'm being cautious. I do not want... I don't want to remove them. And what are they exactly? It's a uh, connection to the top of the of the injection pump. I see. What I'm doing right here is just wedging the, the bolt, which is probably not ideal, but there we go. There we go. That's all three of the fuel lines off, the high yeah. pressure lines? That's all the fuel lines off. What I'm looking for here is you don't want to put um, even rag dust shouldn't be in those in those holes and so I'm wiping them off and making sure the diesel across the top of them the pools there is nice and clean. And because this pump is going to sit here for the for the whole job I want to make sure that nothing gets into it since the best way to wreck a good job is getting um, dirt into the fuel system. Now we're taking off the return line. And these are very low torque. So it shouldn't be hard to come off? No, very low torque. There you see that. That's that end of the return off. That's a lot of turns on that. It's a big bolt. Yeah, it holds holds the return line onto the pump itself. That's one of the that's a number three return loosened off. This is going to be number two. That's loosened off. And then this is number one. That's an interesting te technique of kind of tapping the end of it with your... Shock tends to break things free with less less absolute force. I see. So rather, because I would have thought you just going to grab the wrench and move on it. These are relatively delicate components, and so it's preferable not to be too rough with them more tape to cover up the fuel system. Okay. Yeah, this one's less important because it's a return line, so it's not going anywhere that's important. And there's lots of filters between here and the and the engine, but I still don't like debris in there. Yep, yep. So these return lines actually encircle the injectors. They encircle the injectors? Yeah, that's the injector right oh, there. Oh, that's the injector right there, okay. I'm still so used to the deer injectors, they just look so so little. <laughs> yeah, it's a very different design. It is. And you see, this is why you see the little bits of paint. That's oh, yeah, come on your fingers. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, you re so. really want to keep that away from the fuel system itself. And so no bending, no flexing, just slowly ease that off. And that's the return line. Yes. Concerns? No, just looking for any kind of dirt or other issues with it. Let's take a look at that little pile of lines we've got down there. This is the injectors. I'm just breaking them free first. And normally I would take, I would leave the injectors in the head, but needs, I need them out to have clearance to get at oh, access to, there, yeah. to the head cap screws. There's what a fuel injector looks like. And what you look for there is it, on the injector end is ni nice small coating of fluffy uh, carbon. Yeah. What I'm looking for, just what I'm looking for is any evidence of water damage since this, since ah. this, this is the cylinder that's having trouble. And so water damage, you wouldn't necessarily see rust, you'd see other things. You wouldn't see rust there, no. But it's sometimes, what, sometimes what happens is, is 
you'll see a steam clean effect. These, these injectors all look identical, which is exactly what you expect to find on a healthy engine. Now, why wouldn't you have taken the injectors out and done that test as part of the di diagnosis earlier? Well, we, we, because we care what happened because it might mean that we have to fix more things. But for sure, the cylinder head has to come off because we've got a damaged valve seat that's causing the, the valve to recede. And so as the valve is actually climbing in the head, the head's got to come off. So that part of the story is, is a done deal. So what we'll do is we'll open it up and, and, and see what else we learn. Next thing I'm going to do is this is this is the oil line that, that feeds the rocker shaft. There's those hateful flakes of paint. <laughs> you can see little bits of paint falling off everywhere. Yeah. Next, what I'm going to do is go after the uh, glow plug connection. That's what connects the glow plugs themselves to the power system. What I'm working on now is I'm going to take the air filter off. Now in this area you can see I'm, I've got a little bit more oil on me because that rear main oil seal uh, leaks into this area, sprays out here. I like to use a little care on this point because it could fall into the generator below, so we don't want that to happen. Oh, like the part you're taking off? Yeah. I think I might just get that box out of there just to get a little bit more clearance. Mm -hmm. miss that light we had over the top of the generator? That's a good point. That's a very good point. We used to have a, a large fluorescent light. That Just went, like right on the wing right there. Yeah. It goes down to a boat here. Yeah. And so we've taken that off and it gives, it's just game changing from a clearance perspective. So much nicer to work on. Okay, so taking the exhaust hose off here, you'll see towards the bottom of the engine there that it's uh, it's a bit oily and that's again that rear main oil seal spraying oil out the side of the engine. Oh yeah. These exhaust hoses are usually quite unpleasant to get free. Yeah, they're big hoses. Big and wire reinforced hose and so it's very stiff. So what I usually do is slide the clamps out of the way just to make sure they're not interfering in any way whatsoever and then try to get some rotation on there. And I usually take parts off like this part early um, so that the, the engine's still together. Oh, wow, I'm lucky. <laughs> that, that did actually come free there. Yeah, yeah that's good. That's going to come free. Still doesn't look very easy. <laughs> no, but what will happen is as soon as I undo this, I'll be able to pull it out of the way now. And that's the exhaust elbow you're taking off? Yeah, the exhaust elbow's coming off. And this is the heat exchanger end cap that I'm taking off there. Black boot thing. Yeah. Again, that's relatively stiff, but that one's free. So the hard part of that one's done too. This is the last fastener on this, and as soon as that fastener is done, I'll be able to, or I hope I'm able to pull it out of the pipe, out of that hose. This is the a very nice uh, setup where Northern Lights uses. It detects exhaust over temperature, which is really useful because if the coolant water stops flowing mm -hmm. way before the engine overheats, this triggers 
Was that so it sends her into the elbow? Is that yeah, oh, right, okay. it triggers, triggers an alarm that okay. there's a cooling flow problem. And you can see we've now got that elbow free. Yeah, it's moving. Yeah. So I need to get this end cap off. As soon as the end cap's free, it makes the exhaust easier to pull off. It looks like a pain right away. It's a bunch, there's a bunch of parts that are all kind of overlapping a little bit, making it a bit of a challenge. And so there's the elbow. And even loose, it's not that easy to get out. <laughs> there we go. Is that the exhaust elbow off? Is it any concerns there? Not really, although it's slightly damp from the last time it was run, not far, not far back. Um, super clean though. If you look inside there, it's it's that elbow is as clean as they come. And that's just is that soot on it or oil on it? Uh, soot. Okay. No oil in this part of the engine. So why does it look so wet? Um, it's cooling water flows through there. We checked the exhaust system fairly carefully for any evidence of of uh, cooling water that could get up into the engine because of course that would cause the that would cause the problem that we've got with eroding valves and the water is nowhere close. It's several feet away, so not an issue. However, whenever I see any moisture at all like this, it always catches my attention. Just like to clean that up so we don't mark other things. Next, I'm going to take the other side of that heat exchanger end cap, the other end cap off. Another big hose there, that doesn't look as big as the other one. Is that the same size as? That's the coolant hose, where the other one is, is a mixture of coolant and exhaust. Ah, uh, so it's not nearly as big. Right, so this is free now, so it's not going to cause us any trouble. Here I'm taking off the coolant overflow hose. Oh yeah, that goes into that, that overflow bottle there. Correct. So you're gonna leave that, that overflow bottle in place? Yeah, I can't think of any reason to, to move it, so I'll just leave it sitting there. What's that you're sliding out? That's the heat exchanger bundle. That's, that's what actually cools it. It doesn't quite come out of there, so I'll just uh, leave it in place for now. And right now I'm looking for sensor lines that need to come off it as well. So sensor lines like this is an oil pressure sensor and this is a coolant temperature sensor. So I need to quite see that other one there. Right down, right there. Maybe it's a little dark in there. It is a bit dark. This is the oil pressure sensor. So you can see the cylinder head starting to become more of a standalone component that's yeah. free of everything else. The next thing I'm going to take off is the heat exchanger and uh, exhaust manifold assembly. This is right here, this, this piece right through here. Maybe you could show me on the wing engine what you're doing. Is it the same thing? It is the it's same. It's hard to really get an angle on it. It is the same thing. So what we've done is we've taken off the end cap here. We've taken off the end cap here. Okay. We've taken the exhaust off. We've taken the water temperature sensor wire off right there. Okay. Yeah. We've taken the radiator cap, on the radiator cap, or the coolant cap yeah. off. And I'm now going to pull these fasteners out and, and move this whole assembly away. Okay, so that's the heat exchanger, this, this big box right here. Um, it's a combination. This is heat exchanger in the top, and this is the exhaust man manifold down on the bottom. Okay. So it's an integral heat exchanger uh, and exhaust man manifold. I see, so just one unit comes off together. Correct. There's two of them out, and there's ten total. Definitely nice to have that light gone from up there. Yeah, this, the clearance is wonderful. Normally I'd use that, that uh, power screwdriver for this, but the clearance is just a tiny bit oh, too tight. That's too bad because that looks like a, exactly the kind of job it would be great for. Technically I could leave this on and pull, and pull it off with the cylinder head. I may put it together that way, I haven't really decided. Pass me the 10 millimeter uh, short socket. Okay. There you go. Thanks. Actually, it can fit. Oh, cool. That's great. 
That's a much more efficient sound. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm just going to put a rag underneath that because it'll run a little bit of, of coolant. Won't be much. And I don't really want to get it onto the alternator. Yeah, there it's starting to drip there. So I'm going to put a just a light amount of tension on there. I'll just cut the old. Yep, there we go. Didn't take much, did it? No, it didn't. Oh, look at that. Yeah, so that's free. And there's, I forgot, there's a coolant hose on the lower end of it. So I'll need to get that off right now. It would be more convenient had I thought to take it off before lowering this unit down. Oh, that's the hose that's directly underneath it on the same one on the wing? Yeah. Okay. You're, you're, you're being smart to look at the other yeah, one. Yeah, totally can't see it from here. Yeah, it's yeah. hard to see this one. Yeah. This is dropping little bits of coolant off, so I'm going to... There's still a bit of coolant in there, so I'm going to put a rag in, in below it just to minimize the mess. Did you get your hose off? No, not yet. Ten years of running in place means it's not eager to let go. Oh, that's actually, it's close to coming off. Oh, great. Yeah, there it goes. That's all. Oh, awesome. You can see a bit of coolant running there. Oh yeah, a little bit dripping. Yeah. Well, that's quite the pile of parts you're building up there now. Yep, yeah, it's coming together nicely. This is going to require an extensive clean, so there's a fair amount of work on that. You can see the there's the there's the uh, thermostat right down there. What it does is it maintains the, te the temperature of, of the engine. So they design the cooling system to cool more than the engine requires. I see. And then the thermostat keeps it in the 180 to 195 oh, range. Okay. And how does it do that? What does it do? Opens and lets the, the coolant f bypass the heat exchanger or closes up and forces it through the heat exchanger. 843, that's the number of the engine on there? Yep. That's, okay. And that's the difference between that one and the wing engine beside you to your left is it's an 844. Oh, I see. So I should say 844 somewhere that I can't see? Um, it's just slightly different. So it doesn't happen to say anything on the side of it. It's ah, okay. I don't know if it's a newer or older design, but it's just slightly different. Okay. But here's where it would have said 844 oh, yeah. if it was going to. Now for the valve cover to come off. There's the valve cover off. Okay. I'm just quickly surveying to see what's holding the rocker carrier in place. And what's the rocker carrier? That's this assembly right here. Everything okay. above the cylinder head. And I'm just loosening off the valve adjustments right here just because it's easy to do now. Does the new cylinder head include new valves and everything? Yes. It doesn't have to, but this, this was a new cylinder head assembly. Normally what I would do is I would recondition the cylinder head, which is uh, pull the valves out and, and, and replace the seats and the valves. In this particular case, we're replacing the cylinder head partly for two reasons. One is um, these heads don't have removable exhaust valves. And because this one's worn quite dramatically, I don't expect that we'll be able to save the head. And so for that reason, uh, I would buy a reconditioned head. This particular engine manufacturer doesn't provide reconditioned heads. So we went with a new one. Fortunately, um, they actually, they, they're very fair in their parts pricing. And so it, it ends up not being that expensive a part to get. Yeah, that's something to consider when buying an engine. It's amazing that the variety of prices for parts is the engine itself, but then caring for it can be like prohibitively expensive on some engines. Super important point. Uh, some some manufacturers really get carried away on on their used parts prices, and it's it's really unfair. They know that people seldom ask that question um, when when they're when they're buying when they're buying the boat or buying the engine. What I normally do is. I buy both 
the engines, but also the spares, many spares at the same time, because you can get a, a, a better deal doing it all together. Oh, good idea. Yeah. Here, what we're doing is taking the uh, taking the glow plugs out of the out of the head as well, since I'm going to have to transfer them over to the to the new head. Does the workshop manual actually tell you what you need to take out, or is it just more you just kind of look at it and say, oh, well, that needs to come out to get to that next part? Well, they don't really go into that much detail on it. I, I, and I've got to be honest, I've not looked at it in that much detail. What I care about the workshop manual is I want to know the installation torque for all the components going back together mm -hmm. and any unusual uh, service items. Like, for example, on this engine, they actually have two different cylinder head gaskets available for it. Really? And what's, there's a procedure to figure out which gasket to use. And it's, it's really surprising where we measure the height. You'll see me do this later. We'll measure the height of each piston above the deck, above the top of the block. Choose the, the cylinder where the piston stands most proud. And the height that it's standing above the deck is, is used to figure out if you want a thick head gasket or a thin head gasket. Hmm. Quite an unusual setup. Yeah, and so they sent you two. I, cho I chose to buy two just because I don't want to have any surprises. They're not coming out immediately and easily and there, there's no need to, to, uh, to work at it since the head's coming off anyway. I'll have a look at why. That's the glow plugs you're still trying to get out? That's the glow plugs, yeah. Okay, now what we're going after is the rocker. Uh, rocker carrier. Okay. This, this holds the rocker shaft and the rocker arms. It's like a little tight. It's, it, it'll be the second tightest probably. I think the cylinder has a little tighter. There's two 10 millimeters on either end that I need to pull out. And I'm not even sure if I need to take those or not. It, they might be head bolts. I can't really tell from the angle. So if they're head bolts, you don't have to take them off? Or? Oh, I'll still have to take them off. It's just, it's just not at this point. I see. need to be careful because the last thing you'd want to do is to drop something into the engine since we only have the top end of the engine apart here. Yeah. Yeah, that is a head bolt we were looking at earlier. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> so this is the rocker assembly now free. Is that delicate? It is, and I'm probably being a little more careful than necessary, but I just like to take it easy. So now you're looking at the cylinder head. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is pull the rocker, uh, pardon me, the push rods out, and I'm going to be very careful to keep those push rods in exactly the order they come out in, since they've kind of worn into, into place there. If you're going to put parts back in, you want them back in in exactly the same spot that they came out of. Here you can see the, um, these are the push rods right here. I'm about to remove those. You'll see there's six of them. And then these, I've left the, um, the inject, the, the uh, glow plugs in just because they didn't come out quickly and easily. And I'm just gonna have a look and see if there's anything on the other side. I'm now checking to see if the cylinder head's free. So you see, we need to have the fuel filter uh, bracket off of there. Oh yeah, yeah. Nothing else appears to be, yeah, we're pretty good across the board. So the next thing we're going to have to go after are um, the large number of, of big cap screws holding the cylinder head on there. But, and before we do that we'll, we'll break we'll, we'll break the take the, the fuel filter assembly off. It's very close to being fully apart. Wow that's pretty good. It's not bad it's been it's only 945 in the morning so I'm thinking we'll have a we'll have a coffee break. I'll spend quite a while cleaning it up. It's, 
I want every gasket surface to be absolutely scrupulously clean and I want to clean around the engine and other places where I can't get to normally so probably take I'm guessing we'll probably take as much time cleaning up the parts and getting them ready for reassembly as we've spent uh, so far just taking the engine apart and do you use anything special to clean it like brake cleaner or anything like that or just simple green uh, depends what it is I'll use a wire brush to clean off all of the gasket surfaces so for example nothing convenient here but but um, some of the gasket surfaces will have will have um, gaskets will have ripped off and partly glued oh, yeah. they'll have glued on over time yeah so I'll use a, wi a rotary wire brush a wire brush on a drill to clean those out and I'll get every ceiling surface nice and shiny and then uh, and and clean all the you know all around all around the engine areas as, as well as I could and then I'm guessing we'll have an early lunch mm -hmm. And then we'll start putting it back together this afternoon and see how it goes. Well, wow. looking forward to seeing it back together. No kidding. Yeah. Let me get those push rods out of there. Okay, so I'm going to take them out from number three towards number two and then to number one. We'll also look for wear in here. Any signs of wear? No. And specifically... Is that number three? Yeah, it is. How does that look? Perfect. Okay. They all look, they look just great. And if you saw wear or problems, what would that be indicative of? Uh, stop the job and, and, and uh, replace some parts. I see. The reason why we, we don't expect to find any wear there is the valves are, on this engine are tightening up. If there was any wear in there, they would in fact be doing the opposite. They'd be loosening up. I see. Which is a, a more common failure mode. But not the problem with this engine. This engine's run into a valve seat problem is what I think. Although the proof of that is going to be when we get a chance to see this cylinder head off. Some of these, the paint's so thick that it's difficult to get a socket on it. Oh, really? Yeah. And the reason that's so tight is just it's, it's painted in place. Ah, uh, so you're breaking the paint to get yeah, it off. Yeah, exactly. So it looks like there's a little bit of a shim in here as well. And now this is free of the cylinder head, so we're basically ready to start taking that head off. These will be the tightest uh, bolts on this engine, or up there. Maybe, possibly, there might be there might be some tighter ones on the crankshaft itself. Probably not. That does look tight. Oh yeah. yeah. It is tight. Well, it looks like you got it moving. Yeah, it is tight. Wow, I hear that. I you hear it come loose. These um, have to get installed, get, um, tightened up in a very strict order. I tend to take them off in, in a in outside in order. Right. So the opposite from the order that they'd be tightened? Is that what you mean by yeah. outside in? Yeah. Okay. It's interesting, the torque is less than 100 foot-pounds. They're really, really tight. Oh, I can see the whole, whole engine's moving. Yeah. Is that the last one? Oh no, there's lots more. We've probably not done half of them yet. Well, how many are there? Um, I'm guessing 13 or 14. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Wow. That sounds like you're working hard to get that. Well, I guess suffering a little bit from office worker. <laughs> yeah, you see each, each cylinders right here will be ringed by these bolts. Oh, I see, yeah. <laughs> There's fire coming to investigate. Come on down. Coming to check out the job. Coming to inspect. Oh, he's happy. 
Wow. He's looking pretty good for an almost 17 year old cat. He's looking good. He's looking great. How's that going? Well, I'm just surprised how snug they are. So they all loosen now? Yeah. Oh, great. Oh, so now you can use the okay. Yeah. yeah. So why would you use that to take them off initially or loosen them? It doesn't have the power and I prefer to have to be have feel of it while I'm doing it just to make sure that we don't have a, a, a bolt break or something like that. Okay. So I'll, I'll keep a relatively co close eye on it. And what I'm doing now is checking, uh, making sure the bolts are all the same length because a lot of heads, a lot of heads will have use different length bolts. And because they use different length bolts, you can easily end up making a serious mistake that you don't want to talk oh. about. <laughs> Right, so these are all the same. Those are all the same. But these three are different. Which three? These three oh, along here are shorter. Oh, so you gotta remember that. Yeah. So I'm separating those three short ones off just to remind me that those are different. And that's oil on them? Yes. Okay. And you'd expect that, of course, right? Yeah, they're all running in an area where there's lots of oil. Well, not all, actually. Some of them are outside of that, but most of them are. Now what you up to? I'm looking to make sure there's no other fasteners, no other brackets, anything else. Because normally a cylinder head, uh, cylinder head will hang on fairly tight. So I'll need to use a little bit of a pry bar. Oh, so you may not know if you've got another fastener or it's just the... Right. So I like to be extra careful and just do a bit of a scan to make sure that there's nothing that I'm going to be uh, running the risk of damaging yeah, by applying sense. force. So you got a big pry bar there. A little pry bar. There, you, there you see it's lifting off. Oh wow, it's actually moving. Yeah. Not really requiring much force at all. It's still stuck on the gasket. But that doesn't need to be saved. No, you will not reuse a gasket, or you really don't want to reuse a gasket. You also don't want to use, I started, I put a screwdriver into there, you do not do that. So I did not put pressure on that. And the reason for it is you don't want to put any damage onto the sealing surfaces of a cylinder head gasket. Oh, yeah, so you don't want to nick in it or anything. Right. This one's still hanging on. There it goes. Okay. Finally. So it's just the gasket holding on still? I, it's either the gasket or there's um, split ring uh, locators that, that will hold on a little bit as well. I'm not putting a lot of force on it right now. There we go. Wow. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. That. Let's see what you got there. Everything looks beautiful. You look, what are you looking at? What do you see? Just making sure all cylinders are the same. The same? Why would they be different? Um, something wrong. I see. And that is that the gasket I can see right there? Is yeah, that it's depressing. The, the gasket's torn exactly in half, oh. and it's going to take forever to get that clean. Oh. And these are the split rings that 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 locate it. Uh, I see. So one on each side. I right. So, and so there. that's what that's what it's hanging up on. Uh, it's a combination of that tension of that, and the the gasket is stuck on both sides. Yeah. Which is nice. It means it doesn't leak, but not so nice in that it's just almost impossible to remove. Is that one of the pistons up and then two are down? Is that what I can see? Yep. That's number two up, and number one and number three are both what would look to be all the way down. Certainly, one's all the way down. And you can see light carbon in, in there, nice, but no buildup at all. It means it's been run under good, heavy load most of its life. Yeah, you can see this is going to be really hard to get cleaned up. Fortunately, I don't have to clean the head because I'm replacing it. Yeah. But this, the, the gasket is half here and half on the block. The block yeah. has to be fully cleaned carefully. Yeah. 
I'm going to be wanting to get everything as clean, clean like that, where it's nice and shiny with, and you can see the machining uh, lines in it. So absolutely no rust, no no gasket material, no nothing. I'll use a wire brush to get a, to get all of that clear. Have a look at the at the at the deck surface of the block. You can see there's the the gaskets all ripped up. Yeah. All of that has to be very carefully scraped away. Yeah. And then polished up to, to nice shiny metal. That's going to be a bit of a job. Yeah. It'll take a while. I think the plan is right now. Let's think about this a bit. It's um. Well, I'm just sit down. <laughs> it's it's nice to nice to actually be sitting. Down. Okay, so it's 10.05, this, 10.05. I think what, what makes sense is take a coffee break and then I'll come down and, and do the boring and, and kind of a bit of a hassle. Um, I'll just clean everything. And then uh, I think we can probably, it'll probably take me a little less than an hour to clean everything. And then once that's done, we'll have an early lunch. And then I think after lunch, we'll start assembling this engine and, and there's a good chance it could run today, was my opinion. Our engine now is in pieces on the floor. Stay tuned for part two, where we hope to put all the parts back together and see it running again. You can read more about our trip around the world at mvderona.com, including an interactive map showing our track with a live update of our current location.